in the tissue when you're just breathing ambient air. So to give you an example, depending on barometric pressure, humidity, and elevation, the partial pressure of oxygen will vary in the air that you're breathing. So it's gonna be between 142 millimeters of mercury up to about 156 to 158 millimeters of mercury, depending on what part of the country that you're in, whether you're up high in, in, the, mount, uh, in the Rocky Mountains or you're down at sea level, depending on the humidity and barometric pressure. Now, when you drink four ounces of this water, and by the way, we do the baseline measurement of what your partial pressure is at baseline without anything. So you can see what it is, right? You'll see the graph and you'll see the ch uh, machine changing, and you'll see what your basic um, baseline is which we wait for about five minutes for it to level out. Because as soon as you put it on the skin and you have an occlusive uh, connection between the device and your skin, it's picking up in that tissue, whether it's in your forearm or on the volar aspect or the dorsal aspect of your arm, wherever you've got it, it's picking up the actual partial pressure of oxygen in the tissue. That is not to be mistaken with oxygen saturation that's measured when you put a pulse oximeter on your finger. So partial pressure of oxygen versus Oxygen saturation, two different things. Oxygen saturation is simply the oxygen carrying capacity of the hemoglobin, whereas partial pressure of oxygen is the actual measurement of the oxygen in the tissue. So the analogy would be uh, pulse oximetry or oxygen saturation is measuring how many 18 wheelers you have going up and down the highway delivering oxygen, whereas partial pressure of oxygen is how much oxygen is actually being utilized at those sites where those 18 wheelers are delivering the oxygen. So that's an important differentiation first to, to understand. The next thing is that oxygen saturation is not measuring utilization. So that's why it's important to make that differentiation. So if you have the A2O water, you are going to start seeing after five minutes of, of ingesting it, you're gonna start seeing the partial pressure of oxygen in your tissue starting to drift up. And in this video, it's dramatically demonstrated. In fact, we take the, the device off the skin, we put it back on, and you can see the ups and downs. It's, it's very dramatic. It's about a 20-minute video, and you can see everything. You can watch it again. And rather than me explaining, I'm, I've just explained the difference, but rather than me trying to explain something that's incredulous, you just need to see it with your own eyes. And, of course, I, I was about to stop the video because I thought that's the maximum benefit we could get, and it kept on getting better and higher, and the oxygen saturation went all the way up to 169 0.5 millimeters of mercury, which was the highest that the device could measure. Since then, we have devices that have been developed over the last couple of years that will actually measure the partial pressure of oxygen up to 2,000 millimeters of mercury. And we have found that people that are drinking the A2 water can see their partial pressure of oxygen going from a baseline of anywhere between 35 to 70 increase up to 575 millimeters of mercury. Now it's transient, it only lasts for a couple hours, but then all you gotta do is drink more A2O water. This is also very synonymous with the hyperbaric oxygen therapy. The difference is oxygen, the hyperbaric oxygen therapy, which we do do in the clinic, lasts one hour, and then you have to re-dive uh, for the person to see those benefits, whereas with the A2O water, it lasts for two hours, and all you have to do is drink the water again. Now, in case somebody misunderstands, I'm not making any disease claim or drug claim. This is strictly a structure and functional issue. It's reproducible, and the, the studies have already been published uh, in, in various areas of the world from um, the Far East to Europe, and um, the rest is history. There's also other variations of this where we have where people can actually sub, uh, submerge their bodies into this type of water and it's even higher. So, so you gotta get the make water. Sure that everybody understands the difference between hydrogen, you gotta water, go which is good, water is. therapeutic, and you know, there's many devices that do it, but A2O water, there's no other water that's like that, and you can just measure it yourself and see with the partial pressure function. Incredible, thank you so much. Uh, so, Nick. So if you are um, exercising, you're gonna increase oxygen. If you're drinking the A2O water, you're increasing oxygenation. If you're on oxygen, you're increasing oxygen. If you're um, um, doing anything, you're doing hyperbaric oxygen therapy, you're increasing oxygen. So an increase in oxygenation in the body changes the environment so the cancer is no longer able to survive there. So that's what we mean by physiological optimization, creating the changes in the body that the cancer can't survive. Another example, cancer is an obligate glucose metabolizer. It loves sugar, so we take the sugar away so we're no longer feeding the cancer or you know the, the alkalinity, acidity. Cancer is 
uh, proliferates in an acidic environment, so we want to make our systems more alkaline. These are examples of how you change the physiology so the cancer can survive. So that's our second step, all right? This is what we do when patients come to our clinic. Third step. Third step is immune modulation. The reason we say immune modulation is because sometimes we just have to upregulate the immune system. Sometimes the immune system's damaged, we have to repair it. Sometimes it's a hyperimmune system. That's where you have allergies and we have to modulate it down. So we wanna uh, take the immune system and modulate it in a way so it's effective at identifying the cancer and doing what it's supposed to do. The is target acquisition. Target acquisition is helping the body identify the cancer is being formed. It's important to remember that there are certain aspects of cancer that modern medicine completely ignores. I'll give you an example. There is a thing called alpha fetoprotein and another one called human chorionic gonadotropin. So I'm gonna ask you now, just uh, Jonathan, just to, just to show everybody that you're not just a pretty face, that you actually know what we're discussing here. What let's see if I can disappoint you. Let's, let's see how I got here. So tell me, uh, when you look at alpha feed of protein and human chorionic gonadotropin, which we know are markers of cancer, what other things are human chorionic gonadotropin and uh, human alpha, for, uh, alpha feed of protein, what are those markers also used for? Okay, again. Um, in toxicity? Think about it, okay, you have, you have, Two times you've experienced this in your life. I mean, two, two times. times. The For first any time person, I'm like, birth, um, birth. Birth. Yeah. You have, you have two and kids, then, right? Yeah. Okay. So human chorionic gonadotropin and alpha feed of protein are also markers of pregnancy. Yep. Oh, yeah. These are, yeah. These are markers of pregnancy, oh, wow. yet they're yeah. also non specific markers of cancer. So, how is that possible? Remember, your body is trying to heal itself, but the cancer is very smart. So, it releases human uh, chorionic gonadotropin and alpha fetoprotein to let the body know hey, I'm supposed to be here. Even in a male, it's saying, hey, it's, the cancers are secreting this to almost throw your body off, to throw the cancer, the immune system off, to say, it's okay, I'm supposed to be here. Because what is a fetus? It is a rapidly growing mass in a female, okay? Wow. The difference between a fetus and a cancer is very hard for the uh, system to, disting to distinguish. And so the cancer mimics a fetus rapidly growing. So wow. human chorionic gonadotropin and alpha fetal protein are non-specific markers of cancer, but that is when you do a pregnancy test, you're checking for human chorionic gonadotropin. That's what you're checking uh, for. Amazing. The urine test, that's what it is, right? So well, this is the mysterious link as well between tumors and teratomas, because teratomas are these like false cells, whereas hair and teeth, it's like it was supposed to be a baby, but but I mean, it's it's happening. In, I can be a male and have a teratoma. It's like, right. why it's, would I? It's actually, it's actually, type of cancer. Teratoma is a type of cancer. Exactly. So, uh, so wow. it's, it's yeah. So it's important to understand that the immune system is being fooled by the cancer. So we want to help the immune system recognize. We want the body to help the body recognize the cancer is foreign, and that's where our, our soda comes in. Our autogenous antigen receptor specific oncogenic target acquisition because we isolate the proteins that are specific to the cancer in the urine, we isolate it and then we put it together with uh, fresh components of urine and we inject it back into the body so the body now recognizes the cancer as what? As foreign. So when we introduce five. it in, Maybe the cancer is not being attacked because the immune system doesn't see it as foreign. It's like, oh, this, you know, this, this <clears> is safe. It's, it's releasing alpha feed protein, you know, uh -huh. chorionic gonadotropin is supposed to be here. But when we introduce it into the injection, the body says, uh-oh, this is something foreign. So it attacks it. But when it attacks mm -hmm. that, it's going to follow the same signature. Anything with that signature, it's going to attack. And guess where that signature exists at the highest concentration oh, okay. in the cancer. Yeah. So boom, your immune system naturally goes to the cancer yeah, site. I don't care where it is. I don't care if it's the tip of yeah. your nose, tip of your toes. When people ask me, well, how do you treat this cancer, that cancer? It doesn't matter because as soon as we identify, the body recognizes yeah, this is any, anything with the signature is abnormal. It's going to go shoot it. So we're basically introducing a insurance? signature into the body, saying what? anything with a signature is foreign, attack it, oh, do your thing. Oh, good. I'm not attacking it. Right. I'm not putting poison, poisonous chemo, or burning radiation, or doing surgical procedures. I'm letting the body do what it's designed to do, the way God designed it to work. So that's.
the four step now target acquisition the and the pan. fifth step is maintenance it's that simple so first step systemic detoxification second step physiological optimization third step immune modulation fourth step target acquisition and the fifth step maintenance so that whole philosophy this is step. the overlying um philosophical aspect of what we do and how we do it. And this program, the Cancer Conversation, uh, the Cancer Convalescence Conversations goes into a lot more detail and there's multiple lectures and everything so you can get this. And it's yours for $29 and that $29 uh, will give you all the stuff. If you find that it's not worth it, just simply let, uh, you know, let the just customer service send an email back saying that I wasn't satisfied with this and they'll just refund you money, all right? But believe me, it's, it's more valuable than anything that you've ever done in your life if you are really interested in knowing the truth about cancer. In fact, Jonathan, this is the thing I wanted to talk to you about, that this program is done. You know how long I've been working on this, and mm -hmm. I told you about it last year. So it's ready, and I want you to help me to get it out to the world so people know about it. Absolutely, and uh, that's an honor, truly. No, thank you so much, Dr. Batar, and that's such valuable information. I, and it's a perfect place for us to, to end this because it... You know, I don't know, guys, if you can still hear me or not, but I think we lost Jonathan again. I, I am still on this uh, platform, so uh, not sure if Jonathan's going to be back, but I'll hang on here for a couple of seconds. I can't see any questions or I can't see anything on my end, so I couldn't really... Um, I couldn't really answer anybody's questions because I don't know. I can't see anything coming through. Um, so I'll hold on for another minute. Okay, so I just got a message from Jonathan. He said he's he said he'll be right back. So I think he got kicked off. Little poo poo. Mm -hmm. I will tell you guys uh, about the Advanced Medicine Conference real quick. AdvancedMedicineConference.com and uh, just use the code word auto and check out. Okay, Jonathan, I just started doing the little- No, that's perfect. Button. No, I'm glad you did that. Um, yeah, so and so, but you finish your sentence and then I'll just um, sure. uh, underscore something that you're saying here. Sure, uh, advancedmedicineconference.com. And when you go to check out, you can just type in auto and you'll get a 10% discount from the uh, current price on the tickets. And also if you do go to the past digital access, past events, the first tab on the left, then you get the digital access. That's even a lower discount because you get the past events on digital access plus tickets for this year's event, which is even cheaper. And then type in auto there and you'll get even a, a discount. So it'll still be 10%, but the price will be lower on the tickets. Amazing. That's awesome. Thank you. That's a great gift you're giving everyone. It's really great that people can access this information from wherever you are in the world. It's super affordable. You're getting so much more than, than what you're you know paying for. And, and it, and it can save lives. It can save lives of those around you. Um, you know, these are the kinds of things you, you could put, you know, thousands of dollars on for the price. You could say, Here, here's what it costs. It's worth that much to you. So, you, you know, you should pay for it. But instead, you're making it really accessible to everyone. And that's... I just, just want really to educate good. people. My goal, is, my goal is that a billion people have this information. And my goal with this information is to empower people so they understand that it's not what they think there is. Because once they know this information, then they understand it they will never be able to be victimized. They will never be able to be taken advantage of by the current medical system. That's that's the biggest thing. So once you're empowered with knowledge, you can't be victimized. And uh, Jonathan, if I can just let people know, if, yeah. if you can't remember that website, just remember drbutar.com and you'll see everything there and you can find your way whichever way. If it's autism, you're interested in cancer, uh, the health uh, assessment tool that we have called HeadMap, the conference, anything, all the things right there weekly meditations that we do, our live stream, anything you guys want. A lot of these things are completely free. Our video newsletter archive, which is over the last two years, we've got it, all the monologues up completely free. You guys can go in there um, and get access to a lot of information. Fantastic, that's so so great. And uh, just coming back to the ASOTA, which is A-A-R-S-O-T-A, -A -A, which is 
autologous antigen receptor specific oncogenic type. So right. autologous uh, from one's own tissues or cells, antigen, a, a toxin or uh, poison. No, toxin. no it, well, it can be, but toxin, uh, 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 antigen you. is anything foreign. I got it. Anything foreign. It doesn't have to be a toxin. It can be some, it's just something foreign that's not in the body, the body recognizes as being foreign. And so basically the cancer itself is an antigen in this that's, case. Well, the, 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 yes. The, so we're looking at the cells that are antigenic that, that the body sees as foreign. So like if I take your blood and I put it into somebody else's blood, it's not toxic, but it'll see it as foreign because it's not of the cell. Does that make sense? Got There's it. There's a lot of Got things it. that are not there. So it's important to know the difference between an antigen or a haptin versus a toxin. Got it. And, and someone could say that it, the body is having to either overcome issues that relate to it not being of oneself or so hence why I, my, my application was, uh, I, my, my first way to describe it was toxin, which is not necessarily completely correct, but it's, um, it can be, uh, uh, yeah. an antigen can be a toxin, but in yeah. this case, it's not a toxin because it's a cell that's just gone awry. So it's a, it's a healthy cell that's no longer healthy. So that's why it's foreign. So the body doesn't see it as being part of itself. So it's yeah, there you go. Unless it's a receptor. Uh, receptor. So receptor. Uh, so th this is where cell signaling is coming in because you're talking about communication and so how something is sending and a uh, message being received. I'm just um, using the words and then specific. So, so, anti so antigen receptor specific is specifically talking about the receptor cells and the B lymphocyte. So the way the body makes antibodies is that it creates, uh, think of a lock and a key. So if the lock is the antibody, the key, or I'm sorry, if the key is the antibody, then the lock is the antigen receptor site. And the antigen receptor sites are actually what create the template to allow the antibody to be released. So the only thing that's the difference between an antigen receptor and an antibody is an antigen receptor is actually adhered to the surface of the B lymphocyte. So that's why we call it antigen receptor specific but it is specific to the antigen receptor of that antigen that's something that's foreign in the body that's coming off the cancer we can, I, I can't hear you i don't think anybody can hear you jonathan yeah sorry about that there you are. Yeah, yeah fantastic um oncogen cancer target uh so uh you know specifically hitting this point acquisition so to uh, yeah, okay. gain, well, I mean, okay. it's a military term like to acquiesce a target means to gain access to the target. So yeah, it's a way I got to it. Figure out, here's the target, but I can't acquiesce the target. I, I don't know where the target is. I can't, you know, I know there's a target, but I don't know where it is. So this is a way of helping us to find what the target is to is acquiesce the target. Yeah, amazing. Okay. Amazing. And so, and, and so some huge takeaways here is one is just understanding the, the process of the body, the fact that cancer this mystery we have to understand why why this is happening and what's going wrong with the communication here within the body and how we turn this system back and some of that is going through all of these toxicities because it's this is a, uh, you know, me, me obviously I, i'm simplifying in some ways but these toxins are impeding this communication which is causing in this case um this growth uh, and and then so how you know how do we counteract this? How do we remove these layers that are causing this this issue and this breakdown in communication? Because we're not seeing our body as defective. We're not seeing this cancer as necessarily the problem, but something else that has created this. So this is now this this thing that I think is the problem that I want to go and kill because naturally I just want to cut it out. I want to poison it. I want to burn it. But instead, I need to correct this. What's gone wrong in this system that has caused this to be able to go unchecked. Which is exactly what you talked about about the, um, uh, the pre-programmed cell death, which is the apoptosis, which is now this is no longer held in check. So I mean, amazing and really helpful. And uh, just a practical side note: this is Dr. Ed Group speaking for himself, not uh, this is not me putting words in Dr. Butar's mouth. But I can tell you that Dr. Ed Group has said to me multiple times and on recordings that if, the, if he had cancer, if there was only one therapy, not, and not saying that people should only do one therapy, but if he was given and presented, to, so I'm simplifying this, with one therapy that he could do, he would choose urine therapy. Uh, so, and I'm just saying that so that, again, some medical advice, for all the people that are asking the question around cancer, 
And yes, sure, there could be different things that you could look at to make sure that you qualify to do this and various things. But I'm also saying there are so many people that never try or do anything. They never they learn about urine therapy and how it works with communication, but they're too afraid to do something that maybe could be life saving and life changing for them. And there are books and resources out there to educate yourself because you have to do your own research. You have to make your own conclusions. Dr. Bukata can tell you things, I can tell you things, Dr. Group can tell you things, and a million other people can tell you a million different things, but what research have you done where you've plugged into those resources? So looking at a book like Martha Christie's Your Own Perfect Medicine, so you can understand the mechanism, understand what you're looking at, understand plasma ultrafiltrate, which is what urine is, a filtrate of the blood, an ultrafiltrate. How is the body signaling itself to remove poisons as well as give you missing nutrients to give you stem cells to help you with growth of healthy cells while helping you kill false cells uh which which you know cancers tumors teratomas amazing amazing thank you so much for sharing dr batar and thanks for the gift you're giving away there as well thanks for your generosity with your time and it's late for you i'm one hour later here too and i got a flight tomorrow to sydney australia it's going to be really great to see my family it's been a long time and they're going to get, you know, my grand, my parents get to see their, their grandchildren. It's going to be good. And, um, yeah, and I know you were, you were really supportive to me the last time I was out there. It was quite stressful. We've got a little lull right now, but it's a good time to hang, um, you know, get, buckle down and get our health on track, um, you know, be prepared for what's coming, strengthen our bodies, don't, don't sit back, um, you know, prepare with our finances. I am encouraging people to look at gold and silver right now to protect their wealth. I'm sure that's something that one you do as well as recommend to people. Is that right? Absolutely. I think that uh, you know people should. I, I'm, I talk more about becoming self-sustainable. So you know, have have some type of asset that you can feed yourself. So you know, invest in a little bit of land that has water and you can plant feed. You know, have chickens. Have you know, that's that type of stuff. That's what I think is really important. Uh, Number one. That, that's what's, you know, to be able to self-sustain yourself. So, um, number one, yeah. exactly. Yeah. But if people are like, for example, have savings sitting in the bank, well, let's say they've put money. If there's one thing you could buy, you buy land and water and food. And if you have nothing left, so therefore you have no gold and silver, then you, you made the better choice than somebody that only has assets. But now people have money in accounts, they have savings. Um, and they, there's the inflation question. of the dollar. Yep. You're absolutely right. I mean, so basically, you know, I started, maybe 15 years ago with the, with that whole thought process, gold and silver. And then I thought, well, you can't really throw gold and silver at people as a weapon. And I started thinking, wait a second, the greater value would be ammunition. So then I started doing ammunition. And then after a while, you know, after having so much ammunition, I'm thinking, well, you know, you can't eat bullets, so you really need to have food. And so then there was food and then eventually came that to be self-sustainable, being as self-sustainable as you can. But certainly, I mean, if you've got money sitting in the bank, you remember that inherent money is, has no inherent value. So have something that has more than, like I, I'm not a believer necessarily in numismatic value, but numis, something with numismatic value and then raw asset value. And gold and silver is historically always been, you know, valuable over the last 5,000 years. Gold and silver has always had that uh, that inherent value. So it's a gold and silver don't deteriorate like money deteriorates. You know, money can get wet and get mold and deteriorate and fall apart. And, it's, and U.S. money is not even backed by anything, so it, it doesn't mean anything. Wow, amazing. And silver is astronomically undervalued, which is really interesting that it's com comparable to its uh, value in gold in terms of its scarcity. Dr. Group was telling me that silver, in essence, should be more valuable than gold in that it's in more scarcity. I, I would like to see that verified. I didn't know that to be true, but I, I thought it was an interesting Dr. Group, point. Dr. Group got that from me, so um, you can ask him. But basically, we've had many conversations about this. So mm. if you look at historic value of silver, the ratio of silver to gold has historically been um, – Basically, gold is about eight to twelve times the value of silver. This is going back five thousand years. Over the last maybe twenty years, thirty years, it's been very different. Uh, over the last twenty years, it's become different. It's more like eighty to one right now. So, gold is a precious metal. Silver is a precious metal, but silver is also an industrial metal. So, when you look at historical value of gold to silver, and you see that it's normally uh, it's times silver, and now, right now, it's at like eighty times. You know that. There's, there's no way that sil uh, gold is going to escalate, you know, quadruple or go five, ten times. But silver, just for it to catch up, it's been over the last 5,000 years, there's a lot more uh, upside potential silver than gold.
Wow, amazing. And some people, what they do is, well, they'll trade between silver and gold. They'll once um, they'll ride silver up and then, then use that to buy a gold position and then they'll ride that up and then and then that's quite complicated. Other people can do that, but just simply holding the asset can often be it's certainly you can't you can't really lose when you're, you're in precious metals. And gold is also um, estimated to triple in value in the next again, these are estimates, these are projections. So you can't really uh, default to them, but you can know that there's some some validity there based on projections, based on uh, history and the other trends. Like in this case, the inflation of the dollar is all causing gold to go up in value. Uh, and it's been used since biblical time. And uh, for those that are watching this on this page, you can scroll down and check out the free resources we have and um, some of our uh, trusted um, solutions to those types of uh, challenges with and and how how to go about that process of silver and gold. It's something Dr. Patel we're encouraging people to check out right now so they can make sure that they're protecting themselves. But thanks again. This has been incredible, and I really look forward to reconnecting. And thanks for your hard work and the fact. By the way, you did study with Dr. Hit, right? Yeah. For I didn't I know that until Do- wow. And he was doing urine injections uh, into the subcutaneous fat and basically uh, take. Right. So Dr. Hitt actually was the one who um, I had been talking with him about what, you know, he, he taught me a lot about uh, how to deal with organic, the persistent organic pollutants. And I learned my technique of ozone autohemotherapy through him. And um, basically, he wasn't your ma- was he your main mentor that you referred to? Was it him or is it someone else? Well, when it comes to the, the Arsoda was an idea, a concept that I had. And I presented to him and I said, what do you think? And he said, Rashid, I think it's brilliant. Let me know how it works out. And I'm like sitting there at his kitchen oh, table wow. in Rosarito, Mexico going, oh, but I thought you were going to help me with it. He goes, it's your idea. Go do it. And so I was like, okay. And then that's where we started. The first patient we treated was in Mexico. And um, yeah, it was, it, it was because of Dr. Hitt's work that led me to that uh, awareness. And actually after we saw the Arsoda working, then he started using the Arsoda in his clinic. But uh, he always said that, you know, it was my my invention and I used to tell him that well if it wasn't for you I would have never even been on the right path so uh, but Dr. Hitt was my mentor and I learned a tremendous amount from him he was a he was a phenomenal man phenomenal man wow. he died he died on a Sunday and that Friday he had seen patients and he was 89 years old wow 89 yeah I think uh, David Wolf when he quoted he quoted a couple of years off like 91 or two he thought that he was but he, yeah. Um, or, or even 93, but you're saying he was 89, yeah. yeah. But, and he died in complication with an accident, like a, a car accident, right? No, no, health- he a, he, no, he had a GI bleed, and he basically wasn't feeling well, and he went to the hospital, and then misdiagnosed him, and he went back, and he died. In, so he, he basically had a GI bleed on a Friday evening, and he was dead by Sunday. What, what caused that? Well, um, I'm not sure exactly what caused the GI bleed, but people, you know, when they get elderly, they, the vessels become friable, and sometimes you can end up having, I mean, gastrointestinal bleeds are pretty pretty common. Uh, it's, a, it's like appendicitis, it, you know, it's a pretty common thing to have. Um, it was just misdiagnosed, and it should have been a simple procedure. They should have been able to identify it and correct it, and it's a quick laparotomy. laparotomy to find, you know, you find the bleeder and you cauterize it, and it's done. But unfortunately, he was misdiagnosed, and um, by the time they figured it out, he he passed. Wow. I've heard a lot of strange stories where people talk about Dr. Hitt, but like I said, he was, you know, uh, he was a very, very good friend and uh, close mentor. I spent, I don't know, I probably spent, uh, I probably spent two to three weeks at his clinic every quarter, like, you know, probably about seven times, um, almost over a two-year period. But yeah, he was a great guy. Wow, amazing! Was he Nobel Peace Prize nominated or uh, no, uh, he, winner? He was part of. He was okay, so in the in the United States. He was practicing in Texas, and in the this is in the nineteen seventies or nineteen eighties. His practice was so successful treating allergies. Okay, using urine injections, and he was flying back and forth between Dallas and Houston, and just putting out allergists out of business. And Time Magazine came and interviewed him, and in the in the interview. Basically, you know, he talked about all the different things that he did. Well, the Texas Medical Board decided that he was advertising and charges for advertising. And he said, he said, I've never advertised. And this is because of complaints from other allergists uh, that were in the Houston, Dallas area. 
and they basically took the Time magazine and said, this is advertising. And he said, that's not advertising. I just interviewed. And so the medical board was coming after him. And Dr. Hitt was just a very, very gentle soul. And he didn't want to, you know, fight the medical board. So he just left. He left Texas and he went to Tijuana and started a practice in uh, Tijuana and lived in Rosarito. And when he went to Mexico, he became part of a team that ended up winning the Nobel Peace Prize for their work in immunotherapy and uh, basically with the allergy medicine. So he had developed that and also um, uh, addiction medicine was another big thing that he was involved with. And was either one of those or both of those connected to urine therapy or separate? Uh, no, just the, the, the allergies were basically urine injections, but what we called it Uran injections. And, um, and then from there, that's what I started the cascade with the Arsoda. So our soda is not the same thing. It's very, very specific, and it takes three weeks to make it. But that's um, the, the predecessor, the original ideas were from Dr. What were my ideas that I had that I developed from working with Dr. Hitt. And if it takes three weeks to make things that you are, in theory, using or actuality using aged urine. Well, yes, but, you know, it takes about, it takes about um, 200 and... 245, 250 uh, ounces to make a total of uh, uh, four ounces of, of the actual part that we're introducing into the body. So it's it's concentrated, and so we have to do serial um, filtrations and keep on we keep on filtering it. So that's the process. It's, it's a mechanical process that takes three weeks. But you're right, by the time we get to the end, not only do we have a very, very specific concentrate of specific proteins, but we also have uh, the age aspect. So you're right, I mean, I've never thought about that part of it. It's the specific antigens that we're trying to uh, isolate from there. That's amazing. Like the, the, the beautiful thing with urine is that there are so many aspects to it that mean that there are these other reasons why it's working that we don't know about, uh, that it works, and then there's all these other reasons that would suggest why it is working. And, and one of those is, you know, the stem cells, stem cells potentially replicating. But, and actually, Dr. Group and I are working at the moment to fund some studies in replicating what the Wake Forest did, uh, you, you know, with the aged urine and to, to see how we can you know, validate this and prove this. Because people are having basically using aged urine, um, maybe perhaps through, through enemas, um, again, there's lots that we need to validate, but putting these pluripotent stem cells into your body, um, the potential for regenerative medicine here accessible to all is one of the most amazing things I've ever witnessed. I think it's an incredible time to be alive in the world in terms of what's coming with just a bit of innovation and a bit of grit and, and uh, courage right now. I totally agree. Yeah. I totally agree. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, can't wait to do more with you. And thanks for sharing that. What a rich history that you and David Avocado will share with Dr. Hitt. Um, I, I'm always fascinated to learn more. I feel like there needs to be a documentary done on him. It sounds like the Harold Hoxie story all over again. And uh, you, you're under the real deal. Yeah, I, I didn't know that. I've never talked to David Wolf about Dr. Hitt, but. Um... He worked with him for 10 years in Tijuana and would cross the border. This is what he says. I mean, I you can. You can. <laughs> I, I, well, I mean, I, like I said, I, you know, I, I've never heard that before. I, I didn't even know that. I mean, could it be true? We may have sent patients, to, but Dr. Hitt didn't work with anybody that wasn't a physician. I can tell you that. Yeah, if I work with him, I mean, that he, he basically, no, he doesn't really, he doesn't talk about himself being the, the guy. I mean, David is very open about how he would basically help out where he could and then Dr. Hit would give him the treatments and he'd drink a fresh coconut and then get injected and he was and then he'd cross the border back with the with the cancer patients. So he wasn't working like in the same capacity that you would work as a physician. He was working as someone like helping out witnessing it. And yeah. and so and as to ten years, I'm not saying that he was in in house. But I I think over that period of time uh, just like, I mean, I wouldn't say that I worked with the Hope for Cancer Clinic, but I, I, there was many trips that I made over uh, during during the couple of years, and I was like, you know, learning and and you know, so probably more engaged than what I was with Hope for Cancer, but I, that's probably a way to explain the 
you know, he's not here to explain it because I'm, I'm saying it in the way that I understood it versus the way he actually said it. Um, but perfect, man. Thank you. Yeah, doctor, I just, I'll just tell you that I asked Dr. Hitt once sitting at dinner, I said, because I wanted to, I asked him, what would be the three things that you would recommend? And, and your audience may really like this. Um, I, I, he was such a sharp character. I remember we were driving through uh, from Rosarito to Tijuana uh, at like 1230 at night. And he's driving, he's got, you know, his arm out this and he's driving with arm, one arm and he's like, you know, 84 at this time, 85. And he's just flying through the streets and this comes screeching to a stop sign. I didn't even see the stop sign. I'm like amazed, like, you know, and then he takes off again. And I'm like, how did you know what, you know, how did you even see that stop sign? I didn't even see it. And you know, cause it was not well lit in that part of Mexico, at least back then. And Dr. Hitt goes, oh, oh, well, with the car, you know, the car knows what the stop signs are. So, you know, that's how, that's, that was his sense of humor. And so he, um, I, I just was amazed at how sharp he was and how we were sitting at dinner one night in a restaurant and out of the blue, he says, Rashid, I just want to thank you for educating me because I have always thought that chelation was nonsense. And until I've worked with you, I never realized how important it was. And he started doing chelation actually in his clinic. And I thought it was like, my God, you know, this guy is like, I'm a student here. I'm just learning at his at his feet. And, and he was giving me this huge accolade. And uh, I remember um, at that same dinner, I asked him, I said, doctor, what would you recommend to someone who would like to use you as a target like one day i want to be like dr hit like when i'm 85 years old i want to be as sharp and cognizantly you know intact as dr hit what would those three things be and his answer was amazing he he first said taurine 500 milligrams a day that was his first thing he said donate blood you know to get rid of uh, over blood and he said um doing um ozone auto hemotherapy he said those are the three things that he recommended and um, ozone guy, auto hemotherapy, which is, yeah. and where do you put the ozone in your blood? Well, you, you take the blood out and you ozonate it and you put it back. Wow, well, yeah. That's and then, but, but urine therapy wasn't one of the men, ones he mentioned, the subcutaneous no. fat injections. No, he, he, I mean, he did that for, for allergies. That's how he treated allergies, but, you know, he didn't, uh, it wasn't. He did, that for, he did that for cancer, though, right? For his cancer patients. Um, he started doing that. He, he, he did. He had, uh, but he, he also saw the cancer as, as an allergy. He wasn't isolating the tumor proteins like we started doing, but he was treating it to help the body identify the foreign nature. So basically the way he, the way we do the, the injections, it'll get rid of any allergy within like six to eight weeks. It'll get rid of any allergy. It doesn't make any difference. Now, if you have an IG, uh, e mediated allergy, like an anaphylactic type allergy, you got to be really slow when you start with it. But again, that's why you got to go to a doctor that knows what they're doing because you could elicit uh, an anaphylactic reaction. But yeah, you can get rid of any allergy using that. It's very, very amazing. Good. Amazing. But, but, so he is treating cancer as if it was like an allergy. Well, he was doing that to reduce inflammation. So allergies cause inflammation, and there's you know most people have some type of allergy that they don't even know about. Whether it's a food allergy, is it IgG mediated allergy? You know, very stuff allergy. So he wanted to reduce inflammation. So that's why he was using it. He wasn't using it in the context of actually fighting the cancer per se, but he was using it to reduce inflammation in the body. So that again, it's a physiological optimization, reducing um, the inflammatory cascade because cancer is an inflammatory process. Amazing. And this, this is one of the classic examples. This is my humble opinion here, but I think that the urine was working for other reasons outside of his knowledge. He had his reasons for using it, but it, uh, yeah, it, Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, again, I, I probably, uh, I, I'm not saying this to be boastful or anything, but when it comes to Dr. Hitt and his work with urine therapy, I don't think there's anybody uh, in the world with the, exe with the exception of Dr. Um, uh, Hans. Uh, Brzezinski, Stanislaw Law Brzezinski. No. No, 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 no. Brzezinski's, Brzezinski spent, 10 years in a, in a, um, in India studying where they were using urine therapy. So Brzezinski and I have collaborated on certain things, but, um, there's J Jonathan Hunsaker, Hunsaker. Hold on. Yeah. Dr. Dr. Hunsaker is a person who worked with, he's a, he's a retired, um, Navy doctor who worked. No, no, Jonathan Dr. Hunsaker was the, the co-partner with Ty Bollinger. I think unless he has the same name as that business partner of Ty Bollinger, he's a, entrepreneur, not a, um, 
not a physician. No, this is a physician. Um, not a, not, not Jonathan Hunsaker. Jonathan Hunsaker would get a laugh out of that. Uh, sorry, Dr. John Humiston. H -U -M -I, I can see why you got that name mixed up. Yeah, John Humiston. Dr. Humiston. Yeah, Dr. John Humiston is the only person that I would think that had more intimate knowledge, a lot more intimate knowledge than I do with Dr. Um, Hitt because he's he was the junior doctor with Dr. Hitt. And when Dr. Hitt passed away, Dr. Uh, Humiston. Humiston took over his practice and he's a great doctor but you know he's worked with Dr. Hitt for literally decades and decades and uh, he'd been with Dr. Hitt for probably 10 years when I met him and that was in you know over 20 years ago so Dr. Humiston has been with Dr. Hitt and uh, in, in intimately aware of his protocols but the, with the exception of Dr. Humiston um, I don't but think he's he alive oh, yeah, Dr. Yeah. yeah Dr. Humiston is my age Oh wow! Can I get in contact with him? Would you? Would he be willing to talk to me? Do you think? He's pretty quiet and pretty private, but I can I can see. I haven't talked to him in years, but I could reach out to him. It would mean a lot to me, even if it's a private conversation. If he doesn't want to record it, it'd just be really helpful for me if, if he's willing to record it. Even better. Yeah, you're on the try. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Sorry to put you on the spot there. Um, so fantastic, and 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 yeah, there there is no one that that is is. I don't know of anyone besides Brzezinski, but he's not using human urine, so it's a different, or from the person that's infected, it's a different concept. It makes sense because he studied in India. In India, they, they are using human urine, but they're very commonly using animal urine, cow urine especially, but in this case, he's using horse urine. And I oh, think it's you, fascinating. I'd like to know more about it. He's just, he's just basically isolated the antineoplasms of two or three different commonalities that he found in all cancer patients, but it's not specific to that individual. That's why it'll never work the way uh, something that's very specific to that individual's DNA is. Um, Brzezinski and I both the lot in our work in cancer the same, you know, at the same time, the same at the same ceremony actually, and um, so it's it's a it's a very similar concept but very different because mine is specific to the DNA of the individual, whereas his is very generic and the same for any kind of cancer, any type of patient. And that's where the word autologous and a huge takeaways for people autologous and or, or um why, why did i almost say aut autonomous which is not the word i'm looking for autogenous autogenous or autogenous and autologous both right. both interrelated one related to one's own cells or tissues which is autologous or or um auto autogenous or yeah autogenous uh to um arising from oneself uh, so powerful thank you um so much more to discuss so much more to learn but uh we, you know we'll take it from there and uh again more education for the world on cancer it's never going to be more important i think that god has a cure here and that is um people uh it, it, and it is aut autologous and aut autogenous it is originating from oneself and it is it comes from us that you know we're looking for the cure hopefully we find it what under a rock uh maybe we'll find it in the the supplement industry will say we're going to find it in the remotest part of the world we're going to find it out but this is the way that it's spirituality works yes yeah it's all within it. every one of us we just have to get out of the way and let it, let it manifest yeah so exactly and in, in in romans it says who will say i will send to heaven or to and and or i was descend down to the deep that is to bring christ up from the grave again um but no the word of faith says the word of faith is nigh the even in your heart and, if, and in your mouth and if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart and that jesus is christ um you will be saved and in this case i'm just using this to like it's just the concept of like do i go over here do i go over there do i find it here do i find it there and it says the word is nigh thee and the word nigh means closer than close it's it's right here it's in your heart it's in your mouth um, you know, confess, and so then it, when you when you start and you know applying this to health and healing, when you believe and you know and you you trust that God has the answers there in you, uh, and then then you're much more likely because I realize that we I've I've told people about urotherapy and they've been offended at me, and you know I go guns ablaze, you know how like 
but but um, you know, and I've had many people have been excited, touched, and they've had their lives transformed. <laughs> Gloria was one that you just saw her massively injured from the Pfizer vaccine. Her life is um, the best it's ever been right now. She's living her best life ever. It's beautiful. But she learned to trust herself, trust her body to heal itself, versus to look for an answer outside. And you, you know what it's like. You go to the conferences where the, the doctors are looked at like gods. Everyone's begging them for something instead of realizing that God is guiding them, leading them, and that they have the cures, the answers, and their body is self-healing. Um, and then this state that of fear that's created uh, when we don't trust that is um, is all part of that that dark system. Big Pharma does want to weaponize this against ourselves, and, and you know you can't let them win. You have to trust. So that's that's my last word. What do you think before you sign off, Doctor Patel? I think that God's in control. Just remember that God's in control. And my message that I was instructed by the Creator on December twelfth with my encounter. If anybody wants to actually see the recording of that two hours and thirty five minutes, you can go to ClickView and see. Uh, uh, it was uh, basically an encounter, uh, an unforgettable encounter, and uh, I was told that the message that God, basically God told me that he was proud of me for never wavering from the promise and the pact that I made with him 22 years ago, and then he told me that he had a new mission for me, and I told him, you know, that I'll die a million times if I have to, you know, he gave, he, he basically fulfilled his end of the bargain and I'm just trying to fulfill my end of the bargain and the message was very simple uh, people need to be reminded people need to remember that the reason the purpose of being here on this earth is to exercise free will and unfortunately people aren't doing that so they need to remember that exercise your free will uh, don't go running up and getting vaccines and just know that is not exercising free will somebody says hey well the only way you can go on this cruise is if you get this vaccine and say okay fine give me the vaccine you didn't exercise free will all right, free will is knowing what the right thing is and standing your ground and doing it and understanding that it doesn't matter whether you lose your life or not, the most important thing is to exercise free will because there is no death. And uh, so that's my message and that's my last word. Oh, that's beautiful, thank you. What a, what a great reminder on the, the beauty of free will. Only love, love can only exist in, in a state where there is free will. There is no love outside of that. We are just mere automatons, robots, a reflector, of another man's thoughts god is the creator if he made us like this that there would be no love it would be a loveless state it it, ampl it opens up the the greatest possibilities for the greatest good and the greatest evil uh but that the greatest evil is not a reflector of the creator and um but yeah it's so beautiful for people to see their power the evil is the absence of the creator mm, exactly right it's beautiful now thanks for bringing us back to god and faith and uh Dr. Batat have uh, and I we uh, we love uh, talking on faith and spiritual things. Uh, it's so uplifting, and we actually we come from different religious backgrounds, and yet we uh, we're, we see eye to eye as brothers, and we we worship God um, and connect with God together as as brothers in faith, and and support each other heavenward in this journey of life. and And I appreciate you so much for being a part of the solution in the world, Dr. Batai. You're you're truly um, making a difference in people's lives. Well, so are you, Jonathan. I'm glad that you're putting out these docu series and helping educate other people. And um, so I, I know that you know I've had some friends of mine that are doctors that send me these little clips, uh, and they said, well, just, "Well, just watching one of Jonathan Otto's docu series and just saw you on there." So you know, it puts a smile on my face because I remember that conversation we had when you were uh, when you just started on the on the docu series journey and. Uh, and you, I, I won't go into the details, but you remember that conversation. And yeah, you, absolutely. You picked, that, you picked up that ball and you ran with it and you've done it proud. So well done. Thank you. I appreciate everything you've done for me along the journey. Thank you, brother. All right, I'll let you get some sleep and we'll be in touch, my right. friends. God Have bless, man. Have a safe flight tomorrow. Thanks, my friend. Okay, bye. Bye-bye.